often, but we see this all over the place in modals, in dialogues, in uh, shopping carts, and anything that persists and talks to the server. If you can remove the behavior of talking to the server and make the user experience feel instantaneous, you'll have a completely different interaction for the user. So thanks so much. My name is uh, Greg. I run a company called Raise Labs, and we focus on improving lives through technology and design. And we do that through mobile applications and web services, and we've worked on a number of applications that operate at scale in the tens or, in some cases, even hundreds of millions of users. And so when I think about operating at scale and thinking about building applications at scale, I'm really talking about the human element. And so when you get into those large numbers of folks, we're dealing with people. And we're dealing with uh, the human element, with psychology, with user experience, with frustration and angst. And to build a quality product at scale, you really need to understand the human behavior and the human element and how to get at scale. Because to build something great, and that's really what I'm talking about, it's the fifth star. It's how do you do that? You know, Apple will give you the first star simply by going through the rigmarole of getting your application accepted into the App Store. The second star is really about doing something useful for someone occasionally, right? The third star is getting that more frequent, that the majority increasing of your audience is able to do something useful. The fourth star is really aspirational. You need to really handle the edge cases. You need to handle your performance. And to get to the fifth star, people need to love your product. They really need to engage. And as you're getting up that channel, the level of effort in terms of the software engineering and operation at scale increases exponentially each round. The level of effort to build a five-star app is really extraordinary. You really need to think through all the details and through all uh, the human elements of people using your software. And we'll talk about this in a little bit, but people using your software are very frequently unlike the people you see to your left and your right. The folks that we're really building and designing products for are non-technical. They're kind of the mass audience, and they're looking for your product not to solve a feature or technology, to, but to solve their life problems. Um, and so I'm going to talk through five kind of key elements that I think about to build better products, to build great applications, and to build those applications at scale. So number one is focus on making 80% happy. And when I say focus on making 80% happy, this isn't um, supposed to be simple. You know, the 80% is really identifying the audience, which 80% is really the question you should be asking. Because you, you know that it's impossible to make 100% of your users happy. And so you really you need to take a step back and say, which are the important elements of my audience? Uh, one of the first products I got to work on in my career was uh, a little operating system. And uh, I was working on this operating system, and I was faced with the same challenge. I needed to design uh, a number of features and, uh, you know, this was my first job at a, at a school. I went to Tufts University locally, and I wanted to make everyone happy, right? Like, who doesn't want to make everyone happy? And so I was designing features and technologies and designs and screens and trying to make everyone happy. And in the end, I was starting to get everyone frustrated because I, I was telling my manager, I was like, man, I'm designing this thing, and it's friendly, and it's easy, but all the advanced users think that I'm building like a Mattel Tonka toy, like it's too playful. And my manager said, you know, you have to choose the 60 million people that are not going to like your product. Like, you have to make a concerted effort that you're either going to target for the advanced or you're going to target for the beginners. You have to make that conscious choice and then think about the implications of how to design the product so that those 60 people have the relief valves so that they're not hating on your product. And that's a really important lesson. We've applied that to mobile apps as well, that when you're designing a product for a large audience, you have to take a step back and you have to think, how can I design the relief valves for the other 20%? And so uh, these are relief valves. You know, pressure will build up in a particular system. And so if you're designing a product for uh, an audience, there's going to be a number of folks who are frustrated or not necessarily happy with the default choices that you've made. It's your job as engineers and designers and product managers to make those hard choices to design for the right 80% of your audience. But then it's your secondary cho choice and responsibility to think about the right 
safety valves to put in so that your users are not frustrated. You know, the people in this audience are very familiar with going into settings and preferences and kind of secondary screens and taking the non-default option. Um, and those are the important things to remove that pressure from folks who are more technically inclined, the folks who really know how to build products and technology. We know how to go do those things. The beginners don't. And so definitely think about designing those safety valves. And by designing those safety valves, we can really design at scale. Because designing at scale is about choosing what to remove to satisfy the 80%. By keeping it simple, as you heard in the previous talk, it's imperative that we simplify the user experience. We remove the options that create complexity. We remove the options that make non-default choices break. Right? There's a lot of options and buttons and checkboxes in mobile apps that can really lead to poor user experiences. And so it's up to us to remove those things only to the point where we're satisfying the 80% and not creating undue pressure for the 20%. Apple is um, you know, incredibly good at this, sometimes too good, right? And they've had a history of removing things uh, from the disk drive to the DVD drive to most recently the headphone jack. And this causes a lot of uh, pressure for the folks of us who are more technically inclined. And it is very challenging, I'm sure, for them to think about the design future and where devices are going and to face that future head on. And for us software engineers and software designers building applications at scale, we sometimes have to face those choices as well. How do we remove the right features to make sure that the product is as simple and intuitive as possible so that we can really help grow the mass audience? You know, the, majority of that area under the curve. You want millions and ideally billions of users using your product. It means you need to remove those areas of friction that are going to cause frustration. Uh, one of the biggest areas that cause frustration is actually performance and speed. Um, people have less than a second of patience. And we heard a little bit about how performance improvements have a dramatic impact on engagement. We've seen this is true across a number of fields. This is a quote I pulled from uh, Amazon. Uh, they found that for every 100 milliseconds of latency, it costs them 1% in sales. So 100 milliseconds of latency, 1% in sales. Like, that's incredible. We, we've built a number of e-commerce products as well, and we've seen similar mechanics that when you can improve the performance of an application and get, per, get a person from I'm seeing a product to it's in my cart to it's purchased, if you can get that workflow down significantly, the intuition goes up, the transactions goes up, the hesitancy of making a purchasing decision goes down, and those sales go up. Uh, Amazon published a similar stat. They found that for every extra half second of page generation, their search engine traffic dropped by 20%. And so you can kind of intuit this, right? Like if you're waiting for the search engine, you're not going to type in multiple searches over and over and over again to really refine that search to get it right. And so performance makes a huge impact on your software experience, your user experience. But I don't want you to think that this is just an engineering thing. Performance is not just an engineering thing. It's a design thing, too. Uh, slow is an adjective of both design and engineering. And we think about performance. We really think about how have we designed the software experience to perform. Um, a simple example of this is uh, something that we see in lots of mobile apps, and it's a favorite button, right? Uh, we've seen favorite buttons or like buttons or uh, things like that in lots of different applications. And there's a really big difference between instant and responsive. So when uh, I think instant, there is no cognitive dissonance. There's no delay in how I perceive the action or interaction. When I scroll a table view in a mobile application, I perceive that as instant. It sticks to my finger. And we've all seen mobile applications where it doesn't quite stick to your finger. It feels like you're pushing a slinky around. It's kind of dragging behind. It just feels different cognitively. You react and behave very differently. Uh, in fact, at, at dinner last night, we were talking about some of the uncanny valley of um, you know, HTML5 apps, and what is it? And, and it is this delta between that 10, 20 milliseconds and a little bit higher that loses that. But when you're favoriting an icon, when you're favoriting something in an application, there's a couple, diff couple different ways you can approach it from a design and an engineering perspective, right? You can hit the favorite button. You can instantly toggle that favorite button to a star show it's enabled, and then fire off your background event to talk to the server to make sure that that favorite is persisted. And what I see a lot of apps doing is they do the opposite. They'll, you hit the button, they'll put up a spinner, they'll put up some delay, 
they'll check with the server, make sure the server is acknowledged, it's given an OK, I got the message, and then they'll toggle the star. And I'm using the favorites example because it's non-modal, but we see this all over the place in modals, in dialogues, in uh, shopping carts, and anything that persists and talks to the server. If you can remove the behavior of talking to the server and make the user experience feel instantaneous, you'll have a completely different interaction for the user. And it's important to say, like, if you look at the top one and the bottom one, in the top one, the server actually can be slower, right? If that background process takes a second or two seconds or five seconds or even 10 seconds to complete, the user experience for the first one is still significantly better, right? Because that action happened instantly. The user went on with whatever they were doing. It got persisted later, whereas in the second one, you have to spend a lot of engineering time to actually get that interaction to be fast enough so it doesn't delay that particular screen. And so this certainly is true of instant and responsive, but there's a number of other things that designers should be thinking about. Like oftentimes, designers will design a screen in Envision or some mock-up in Photoshop, uh, but they don't think about the interaction between the screens. And oftentimes, the interaction between the screens is just as important as what's on the screen. And so interruptive, you want to make sure that the designer is thinking through what happens during the interruption. You know, is this something that we need to network call? What is going to go on screen? Or something that's going to be delayed even further? And should we be putting up a progress bar? Should we be putting up some other notification uh, so that the user isn't frustrated and getting lost in the user experience? Uh, design can actually be used to enhance and hide performance elements as well, uh, both enhance performance, enhance sales. Uh, this was an app that we designed for B&H Photo, their large photo retailer. And when you add a product to a cart, we wanted to show the related products. And getting all of the related products and the photos for the related products, you know, it takes a little bit of time. And so we wanted to do two things. We wanted to train the users of where the shopping cart was, and we wanted to load the related products. And we were able to do that with the combination of design and engineering. So you see, as that uh, product animated into the cart, we, in the background, were able to fire off the network event to fetch all the related products. So as soon as that item enters into the cart, we were able to open up the related products. Uh, this had a huge impact to similar product sales. So, you know, I bought a camera, I very likely want a lens or some memory or some other things like that. And by having that interaction really reduced and having to the user a perceptual latency of zero from the time they clicked add to cart to the time they saw related products, it really improved the user experience and hit performance as well. Another example of this, and this came from a, a talk that Mike Krieger gave from Instagram, is how Instagram actually posts photos. And so uh, you take a photo, you filter it, you hit the next button, you start typing your comment. While you're typing your comment, that photo is actually uploading already. So by the time you're done entering your comment, the majority of your photo is loaded. And so as you think about the design and performance of your mobile applications, uh, know that you can actually use design and psychology and the ordering of your operations and server calls to actually improve the user experience dramatically. Next thing I want to talk about is kind of who our users are and how we think about that. Um, we, and I'm talking to everyone in this room, anyone listening to this video later, we're unlike the people who use our products. And we really need to recognize that we are different. Uh, we're different in a lot of different ways from legibility, accessibility, network connectivity, and usability. We have different elements of knowledge and interaction and even physical abilities that may be different from our target users. And I, I always remind myself when I'm building a product in a mobile application specifically that we're a little bit different. Uh, as a simple test, I sent an email to uh, friends and family and my designers and engineers. It was a simple email that asked them to take a screenshot of what my email looked like. And so uh, the small text is what all my designers are using, right? My designers have tiny fonts. They have great vision and eyesight. If they don't, they have incredible glasses and large retina screens, and they've blown everything up. They love small typography. Uh, my parents, my in-laws, uh, my sister, other folks who are less in the technology space, they actually don't have as great vision. Um, and their typical mobile devices have significantly larger fonts. Now, 
Email is fantastic because they actually use adaptive fonts. The majority of apps that we see don't take the effort to use adaptive typography in their products. And it's a shame. But designers and engineers should be aware of this, that the legibility of your product makes it slower for users to interact with them. It makes their comprehension uh, higher in terms of uh, their frustration when they're trying to read some, some of the tiny text or comments in types of applications. And this is just legibility. If I think about everything, like 61% of folks in the United States wear glasses or corrective lenses. 19% have some kind of disability, where it's, whether it's a cognitive, physical, auditory, visual, hearing, speech, disability, and 25% don't have high-speed internet. Um, I'm pretty sure the majority, if not everyone in this audience, has high-speed internet at home. And so um, not only do we need to be thinking about um, who we are, but we need to really identify who we are not. And uh, the things here I'm talking about are kind of those physical elements or situation elements, whether I have internet or not. Uh, but they're also cognitive as well, the things that we have in our head. Uh, you know, the comp sci workforce equals 0.003% of the U.S. population. Like, we know a lot of stuff uh, mentally about how to interact and work with software that typical folks don't. In fact, we're taught in school uh, to think about things in object-oriented fashion. Uh, most folks don't think in object-oriented fashion. They're taught to think in task-centric fashions, like what do I do with these things? What do I do with these ingredients? What can I get done? And a simple example of this, if you look at uh, icons in a typical mobile application, you see these all over the place. I call them semi-universal icons because we in this room think that they're universal and they're not, right? Like we've, we've all seen these applications and these icons, and so I'll, I'll point to them and audience participation time, you say what the task is, what the person should get done by clicking it. Ready? First one. Email? Okay, next one. Settings. Shopping cart? File attachments? Search, find, lots of, keep going. Oh, a little more fuzzy. Okay, Lo location, where am I? You know, favorites maybe. As we start getting more and more of these, and we start seeing the disparate use of these universal icons across lots of different applications, they start to mean different things. And it's very natural for designers to want clean interfaces and start removing the icons, and we see this across lots of social apps. You have to really do the usability and put these products in front of folks to really make sure that they understand and they're not stumbling into your application, but they're really using it effectively. Uh, this is a screenshot I took uh, of Instagram. They, they've since changed their design a little bit, but you know, I used to poke fun at the, the washing machine icon and the love to chat, that if you have things that are not universal, people may find them, they may stumble into them, but they may have that level of frustration that they don't really know what this is. And so we put all of our products through usability. I think it's really important that all engineers, especially engineers thinking about operating at scale in the tens of millions or even billions of users, to use usability to extract yourself from the user experience of that product. You want to make sure that you are testing your products and watching people who don't have that cognitive knowledge of computer science. They don't have the same presumptions around text and tactile and usability and gestures and things like that that we've built into our heads. So definitely put your products through usability. Make sure that you're extracting yourself from the experience of that product. Uh, the fourth thing is how things break is as important as how things work. You know, we often think about the happy path, we QA for the happy path, but we need to think just as critically about the error messages and conditions of how things break in a mobile application, especially when we're thinking at scale. Um, you know, I talked about building applications to do the instant user experience, and again, I'll put that as number one. We want to build products that are fast, they're getting through the experience, they're doing it well. But then you want to think through all the conditions and all the user experience elements where that doesn't work. You know, do you have a placeholder if the server's taking more than 100 milliseconds? Do you put up a spinner? Do you put up a progress bar? What is the error and recovery states you put in there? Uh, this is an example from an app. Um, uh, a Twitter client that uses uh, instant and recovery. You know, when you, f when you favorite something, they instantly do it and then they queue up the favorite in the background. And then if it fails, uh, they will give you a retry mechanism to retry that. 
Uh, here's another example. They'll think about the design of no data. And so not only thinking about the design of when the product does have data, but making sure you have the right user interface elements when you don't have data. Uh, when you're designing for initial and ending states, you know, sometimes something you have to get onboarded, you have to begin. And so we take for granted, uh, once I was interviewing a user um, and he was staring at the screen, we said input data into the form. And he's like, what form? Because he was looking at a white box and he described, I just see a white box. You know, us in the room, we all saw a text box. Oh, you put your focus there, you tap on it, then a keyboard will come up. He was staring at it and said like, I don't know what to do. There's no keyboard, I don't know how to type. Uh, and so we have presumptions of how to start and how to begin and how to use these modalities. Our users don't necessarily have those. And then thinking through recovery flows. You know, we know what to do when things don't work. You know, we know how to get into settings. We know how to change preferences. We know how to turn on location services. You know, our end users may not. And so thinking through, and this is a screen, I think, from Waze, that if you disable location, they walk you through exactly how to get, and they'll actually deep link you into settings to go fix it. Thinking through all of those, you know, we're able to really solve the user experience. And we're not only solving for the end user experience on a slow network, but we're also addressing the issues if the server happens to be slow. You know, we're not only solving for no network, we're also solving for the scenarios where the network uh, happened to go down for whatever reason. And then the most important thing when building products, and I think about this all the time, is we need to inject ourselves into the product. We need to inject love into the products that we build because when we build products that we love, that's the only way to get them to scale. So thank you so much for your time.